coming up. New answers to a very old question. Is there life on Mars? The red planet has long offered tantalizing clues that we Earthlings are not alone. There was always a sense that Mars was different from the other objects in the sky. But how different? Missions now on the drawing board will help us learn more about our galactic neighbor. We could have humans on Mars by 2008. Mars is hot, the subject of books, miniseries, and movies. Interest has grown since the recent discovery that there may have been water on Mars. And where there's water, there's usually life. We stand on the verge of solving one of mankind's most intriguing puzzles. Join us for The Search for Life on Mars. August 7th, 1996. NASA Administrator Dan Golden calls a press conference to announce an earth-shaking discovery. Contained within this potato-sized meteorite just might be scientific evidence of life on Mars. Even America's commander-in-chief weighs in on the four-pound rock. Today, rock 84001 speaks to us across all those billions of years and millions of miles. It speaks of the possibility of life. If this discovery is confirmed, it will surely be one of the most stunning insights into our universe that science has ever uncovered. Isn't it a kick to live in times when we're discussing this as people? You know, rocks from Mars, maybe life. Let's go find out. Ooh. These are indeed heady times in the history of humankind's fascination with Mars. In fact, we've learned more in the last 35 years than we have in the past 3,500. But the reasons why Mars holds such an exclusive place in human consciousness goes back to the dawn of history. There was always a sense that Mars was different from the other objects in the sky. To the ancient Egyptians, who were the first to record its presence in the night sky, it is Hard Detcher, the Red One. There's two really straightforward things you notice about Mars when you see it with the unaided eye as the ancients did. One, it's red. The other thing they saw about Mars is that it's all over the map. It doesn't have a nice, tidy, orderly behavior, and that also caught the eye of the early astronomers and made them think that this planet, if anything, uh, was not completely under their control. The Greeks named the peripatetic planet Ares after their god of war. And as early as 250 BC, a Greek astronomer proposes that Ares is one of several planets, including Earth, that rotate around the sun. But scientific opinion favors the Roman astronomer Claudius Ptolemy, who insists in 140 AD that the planets and stars revolve around Earth. And that was a pretty good explanation uh, for 1,500 years almost until Copernicus and then Kepler showed the true way. In 1543, Polish astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus proves the Earth and all known planets revolve around the Sun in a circular orbit. It will take another 60 years for German astronomer Johannes Kepler to prove that the orbit of Mars is elliptical, thus finally explaining its strange movement. It is the birth of modern astronomy. In the old days, they were getting discrepancies. They had the rough picture of what Mars did, but exactly what it did in detail took a longer time. For the next 300 years, scientific observations of Mars are only as detailed as the sophistication of the telescope. The 26-inch refractor in the telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory is a far cry from the one-inch lens that Galileo Galilei uses to make the first magnified observations of Mars. Through Galileo's telescope, Mars is the size of a pea held eight feet away. Those early telescopes, you couldn't see much detail. It was kind of smudged, and, and no one knew what to make of that. But by the Renaissance, you're getting people understanding that these lights in the sky are worlds in space, and that they are, in fact, places, not gods. 
And Mars is a place that seems to be more and more Earth-like with each new, more enhanced observation. 1659. Christian Huygens of Holland determines that the Martian day is nearly the same length as Earth's. 1672. Huygens discovers that Mars has white polar caps. Then, in 1877, Harvard astronomer Asaph Hall discovers Mars has two moons and names them Deimos and Phobos. And Giovanni Schiaparelli reports a sensational new finding that will spark the imagination of the world for the next half century. The Italian astronomer Schiaparelli was the one who really emphasized the idea that there were channels on Mars, that there were these markings, these long linear markings on Mars. And the trouble was, if you call it trouble, that Schiaparelli reported that Mars' surface had canali. And of course, those of us speaking English immediately think canals. And when we think canals, we think of boats. And so there was the notion of a civilization implied by the use of this word, which wasn't necessarily intentioned. In 1892, in the midst of the scientific debate over Schiaparelli's Canali, Camille Flammarion, the founder of the French Astronomical Society, discovers a strange cyclical phenomenon on Mars. He calls it the wave of darkening. As the Martian spring progresses, dark patches on the surface gradually spread from the poles to the equator and then recede at the end of the Martian summer. And it seemed to people that the best way to explain that was seasons. Just like seasons on the Earth change the vegetation, the same thing could be happening on Mars. So you have vegetation changes, water in Canali, civilizations irrigating and somehow managing to engage in agriculture on a distant world. But these dual theories from Schiaparelli and Flammarion remain virtually unknown outside of the scientific community until an enterprising amateur astronomer named Percival Lowell enters the picture in 1894. Percival Lowell came from one of the best established Boston families, famous Lowells. They were statesmen, they were thinkers, they were scholars. They were also dreamers. And what Percival Lowell dreamed about was Mars. He grew to love the planet Mars and felt it would be his life's work and he built an observatory basically dedicated to the study of Mars with an excellent telescope in an excellent place. The Lowell Observatory still stands atop Mars Hill just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. At the turn of the century, while cowboys roamed this region of the Wild West, Percival Lowell was peering at Mars through one of the most sophisticated telescopes in the world. So. Lowell was equipped to do the finest observational work on Mars, and he was in charge of the only observatory that did it full time. Therefore, uh, it was not surprising that people took his results seriously. They should have. Lowell reports that he is observing and cataloging 183 canals, four times more than Schiaparelli observed 20 years before. These lines were so straight and so long and seemed to have some characteristic which was planned they had to be, he thought, um, invented, created by very intelligent beings. The only problem was he added uh, all these features which we now know are not correct because of the human tendency, the eye and brain working together, to see lines where there are only fuzzy dots. At the turn of the 20th century, Lowell's scientific papers are considered groundbreaking, well thought out science. And with a prescient instinct for the power of the media, Lowell also gets the public on his side by publishing his maps and theories in easy-to-read editions. Well, Lowell was such a good salesman for his ideas, for his visions, that almost everybody simply assumed that there was life on Mars. The big debate was whether or not there was higher life, whether or not there was Martians. What Percival Lowell begins as a man of science is taken up by the world of science fiction, and a genre is born. At the end of the 19th century, inspired by the discoveries of Schiaparelli and Lowell, most people believe there is intelligent life on Mars. Canals on Mars were a popular theory, and to some people a very evident uh, observational fact, for at least two generations, for 50 or 60 or 70 years after Lowell first wrote about them. Writers are the first to take the potential discovery of life on Mars and run with it. Every time there's a new discovery, some authors say, Ooh, would that make a great story. The key moment came when H.G. Wells wrote a novel called War of the Worlds, in which he imagined hostile Martians landing and attacking the Earth and 
well on their way to victory until human microbes did them in. War of the Worlds becomes the best-selling novel of its day, despite its terrifying theme. Not only do Martians exist, but they are a hostile civilization capable of reaching Earth. That picture of alien invasion was perpetuated right through the 20th century and in fact hasn't really gone away. We can't quite make up our minds whether the aliens are completely friendly or somehow have uh, evil things on their minds, but you can trace much of the development of these ideas uh, to this early science fiction work. By 1899, most in the general public believe, through science fiction and science fact, that Mars is not only habitable, but inhabited. It was a world like our own, where you could pretty much project your imagination and let it roam free. It was realized Mars was a possibly inhabited world. Uh, the, the, the natural response of human beings uh, is, is, well, can we talk to them? Uh, you, you either are afraid of anybody that's out there or you want to have a party. The radio pioneers like Tesla and Marconi from the very beginning had the idea that we might communicate with Mars. Tesla published a little article in 1901 called Talking with the Planets. And he predicted in there that this would be one of the major themes of the 20th century, the communication with extraterrestrial intelligence which he believed he had already detected on Mars would continue in the 20th century, and he was certainly right in that context. In 1917, Edgar Rice Burroughs, who would later gain fame as the creator of Tarzan, writes A Princess of Mars, the first of 11 Martian novels he calls the Barsoom Saga. Edgar Rice Burroughs treated Mars as a frontier for the individual to go and explore and meet native princesses and get rich. Uh, this is a little boy's fantasy that sometimes little boys grow up and they may come true. Seven years later, in 1924, Amherst College astronomy professor David Todd is convinced he can establish radio contact with Mars. He enlists the help of C. Francis Jenkins, an early television pioneer, and together they build a receiver that graphically displays radio waves on a paper printout. Todd, Jenkins, and their Mars machine impress even the U.S. Department of Defense. Todd actually succeeded in getting radio silence from the U.S. Navy uh, and, and getting the Army Signal Corps to listen in to signals from Mars in 1924 when Mars was making one of its regular close approaches. Within minutes, the Mars machine picks up radio signals from an indeterminate source. Uh, what came out in the picture was something that looked like a face, and Jenkins said that he really believed that uh, this was not something related to Mars, but Todd said that maybe it could be. Their inconclusive results and the almost laughable caricature of a face is a severe blow to the search for life on Mars. But another scientific discovery in the same year is even more devastating. In France, E.M. Antoniotti finds that the so-called wave of darkening is caused not by seasonal vegetation, but by seasonal dust storms kicked up by Martian winds. Between 1925 and 1950, Astronomers discover that the Martian atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide and that the average nighttime temperature is 200 degrees below zero. It is left to the creators of science fiction to keep the dream of life on Mars alive. In 1938, they do so with one historic broadcast. In a radio adaptation of War of the Worlds, actor-director Orson Welles and his Mercury Theater create a panic all over America. This was the late 1930s, at a time when scientists pretty much knew that there could be no intelligent life on Mars. Yet, the reality of this radio broadcast saying that they were actually here uh, really was deeply felt by a lot of people. We are deeply shocked and deeply regretful about the results of uh, last night's broadcast. The notion that we could be invaded was very much in the back of people's minds because everyone was very well aware of what was going on in Europe. Throughout the Second World War and into the 1950s, popular culture capitalizes on the growing national mania for all things Martian. It is a convenient way to dress America's fears in alien clothing. In 1953, the movie version of War of the Worlds is released, and H.G. Wells' classic is transformed into a Cold War cautionary tale. 
In Red Planet Mars, the evil Martians are barely disguised communists. It's not accidental that all the space-oriented movies made during the 50s dealt only with hostile intruders. My favorite is Earth versus the Flying Saucers, where the Flying Saucer lands, and without the least inquiry, the army merely wheels up its cannons and starts firing. Sales of wind-up flying saucers and ray guns replace the six-shooters and spurs of old. And science fiction novels like Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles outsell all other fantasy genres. So you get people reading science fiction and more people writing science fiction, and this whole thing begins to evolve. And what do you do? You wind up inspiring a generation of engineers and astronomers and scientists who decide that this is so cool, they want to go and do it. And that's just what they did. In the 1950s and 60s, as astronomers learn more and more about the hostile forces of nature at work on Mars, it's pop culture that keeps the dream of life on Mars alive. In 1963, for example, University of California Berkeley professor Hiren Spinrad theorizes that water on the surface of Mars is nearly impossible. While on television, CBS debuts its most popular new primetime series, My Favorite Martian. The very next year, on November 28, 1964, audiences get another new Martian TV show, and this one is real. Ignition. The six-year-old National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, launches Mariner 4. It is not the first Mars probe, that distinction goes to the Soviets. But Mariner 4 does go higher, faster, and farther than any spacecraft in history. And it is the first to successfully fly by the Red Planet. For the first time, humans sent a spacecraft and photographed not just another planet, but a fascinating planet, Mars. And people were quite excited about that, and rightly so. Even as the first spacecraft that NASA launched to Mars was on its way, we were imagining a planet that was very Earth-like. On July 14, 1965, Mariner 4 snaps 21 black and white images. 5,000 years of speculation is about to come to an end. And the first pictures that come down to the Earth show us something that is almost indistinguishable from the lunar surface. You kind of think it's going to look a little familiar. Instead, it was this barren, harsh, cratered world. We were very disappointed. There was no linear feature. There was no evidence of water on the planet. And overnight, this vision of Mars as a kind of a friendly, maybe a little rough, but friendly planet uh, had to evaporate to a world that was much more like our moon. In short order, Martians are passe, and pop culture begins searching outside our galaxy for space-age life forms. But while the U.S. is engrossed in Lost in Space and Star Trek, NASA presses on. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. In 1969, it seems the world stood still when Neil Armstrong placed the first human footprint on the surface of the moon. But just three weeks later, there is little notice of 198 new images of Mars taken by Mariners 6 and 7. Then, on November 14, 1971, Mariner 9 becomes the first spacecraft to successfully orbit Mars and transmits more than 7,000 new photos. Among the breathtaking pictures is a view of Olympus Mons, a volcano the size of Colorado, the largest in the known universe. And we really got a full look at the Martian surface. And we saw, for example, it has giant volcanoes, extinct volcanoes, but fascinating in the sense that it proved that, like the Earth, Mars has a whole history of volcanism and uh, eruptions and all sorts of geological activity. And also we got a deep look at the Martian surface, including the famous Martian Grand Canyon or Valles Marineris. There were uh, channels, maybe closer to Schiaparelli. They weren't straight, they were kind of wiggly, but they looked like maybe water had flowed in them. And we saw features on the surface of Mars that looked so much like what we see on Earth in our deserts, dry stream beds. However, these were hundreds of kilometers long, extremely wide and deep channels. So the prospect that there had been liquid water at the surface greatly increased the possibility that there could have been, uh, could have been life at, at, at one time. We were suddenly back in business again. 
Four years later, in 1975, NASA launches Viking 1 and 2 just three weeks apart. Both Vikings orbit Mars and collect more than 50,000 images. And Viking 1 and 2 do something new. They land. The vigorous space exploration effort at that time um, led us to believe that we should attempt a home run. We hope there was life there, let's go and find out. The main intent of the Viking missions was to see if they could detect metabolism, life. The Viking landers are equipped to perform three life-seeking remote-controlled experiments. Each of these three experiments actually yielded a positive signal. But further analysis on Earth indicates that the signs of life Viking picked up were actually standard chemical reactions that imitate life processes, but aren't. This was probably the point at which we went from thinking of Mars as an abode of life, a title which Percival Lowell created for his early book, and uh, began to think of it as a place that might have once had life. The Viking missions have a devastating effect on further Martian exploration. We did not find life, which everyone, the public, the science community, had begun to believe was the end objective of that mission. And in a sense, in an attempt to hit a home run, we brought to an end the Mars program for 20 years. But in another of the historic pendulum swings between science fact and fantasy, a few pictures from the Viking orbiters send the life on Mars debate in a new, bizarre direction. We were taking very detailed pictures of the surface early in the Viking mission to try and select the landing sites. And uh, we were amused by one of these pictures. We could see a, a kind of a, something that looked kind of like a face. The image of a face transmitted from the surface of Mars harks back to 1924 and the radio wave collected by scientists Todd and Jenkins. Michael Carr, who headed the Viking imaging team, makes the fateful decision to release the picture to the public. We were releasing pictures every day and trying to keep everyone excited about what was going on. It just seemed like a little amusing little thing to do. What Carr and NASA see as an amusing fluke, others see as evidence of a Martian civilization capable of engineering the largest sculpture in the universe. Best guess is that the face, if it is artificial, was a pre-existing landform that was worked to make it look more face-like. The evocative face becomes a cottage industry. From just one image, literally hundreds of enhancements and reinterpretations are released. But the face on Mars became an iconic figure, and therefore, if you have a face a mile across, it proves A, that an intelligent civilization exists, and B, their faces look a lot like our faces. This is a kind of a reversion back to the, the old days of Schiaparelli and the, the, the Canali, where what you see uh, may not be really there and may not be what you think it is. The official explanation is that the face is produced by a trick of light and shadow. To test that theory, independent image enhancement engineer Mark Carlotto builds a computer model showing the face under different lighting conditions. What these results showed was that the facial features, instead of disappearing, actually persisted over a very wide range of conditions. And this suggested to me that it was not an optical illusion. Additional pictures from the area around the face, a region known as Cydonia, are offered as further proof that the face is a Martian engineering marvel. It's not just one anomaly, but it's a group of anomalies that are close together. The collection of pyramidal shapes becomes known as the Sidonian Complex. Now if we look at these selected objects, they're all about the same size. They're all oriented in the same general direction. This suggested the possibility that there was a bigger picture here, not just an isolated formation that happened to look like humanoid face, but a set of objects nearby that may have been a place where the people who built the face could have lived. I think that one is doing what we've done so often in the past, and that is trying to place humans at a planet. NASA's skeptical reaction to the face on Mars is seen by Mars believers as a full-blown government conspiracy. And I specifically was accused of suppressing the um, images. I was accused of all kinds of malfeasance uh, because I was in charge of the experiment. 
it was clear that they would not accept it because the whole premise, the belief in the possibility of large artificial structures created by an advanced race of beings was considered completely impossible. It will be 22 years before NASA returns to photograph Cydonia again. But a new discovery made in the interim will bring the two sides together in a way they never thought possible. Suddenly, everyone agrees life on Mars could be a reality. 1984, Antarctica. A six-person team from the National Science Foundation is combing the Allen Hills for meteorites. It was as we were leaving the area that um, I spotted this meteorite. Um, so I called over um, the team and, and we all looked at it. At the time, we had no idea where it was from, what, it, what kind of meteorite it was. It was just, we were going to pick it up. Although more than 300 meteorites are collected on the expedition, Roberta Score remembers this one meteorite in particular because of its unusual greenish color. Sample ALH84001 is collected and kept frozen until SCORE brings it back to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I kept telling my colleagues, oh, wait till you see this green rock, and then when we opened it up, it wasn't green, and so they all kind of laughed at me. But it is SCORE who will have the last laugh. The meteorite is classified as a diogenite, a common meteorite type found between Mars and Jupiter, and it's stored in Houston along with thousands of others. It isn't until nine years later in 1993 that anyone bothers to take a second look at ALH 84001. Dr. David Middlefelt, a geologist at the Johnson Space Center, finds traces of Martian atmosphere in ALH 84001, and now Roberta Scorr's little diogenite is reclassified as the 12th of 12 known Mars meteorites. Just how it got here from there is equally fascinating. The best guess is that it started its trip 16 million years ago when an asteroid-sized meteorite hit Mars. The meteorite hits the ground, and a shockwave goes out from the impact. And that shockwave basically peels back the ground, and some small fraction is peeled back so fast that it can leave Mars because Mars has a low gravity field. So it goes into the orbit around the sun, and then ultimately some of it falls on the Earth. Thousands and thousands of tons of Mars have rained on Earth over the past millions of years. Now Roberta Score's Martian meteorite gets more attention. In 1994, NASA geologist Dr. David McKay takes a look at Mars meteor number 12 and finds something else, something that will re-energize the foundering life on Mars debate. The Dave McKay group knew that I had been on this expedition, so they came up to me and they started asking me a lot of very strange questions about this rock, and so finally they let me in that they thought that they had some life in this meteorite and they suspected it was from Mars. This was two years before it came out um, to the public. That public announcement happens on August 7th, 1996. We're here today to provide exciting scientific findings that lead us to the direction that we think life might have existed at some point on Mars. My reaction was, I well remember, see it's funny, you go out to dinner and you come back and the Earth has changed, the whole world is different. The McKay Group cites four factors that indicate life. Carbonate globules, magnetite particles that look like they were made by bacteria, objects that resemble fossilized bacteria, and the presence of organic compounds called PAHs. The evidence is compelling, but many scientists argue that it is not proof of life on Mars. It turns out these organic molecules that are called PAHs are uh, very common in other meteorites and they can be readily produced without life being involved. The rock ALH84001 doesn't by itself really prove that life might be more or less abundant outside Earth, but it does confirm all our current thinking that life on ancient Mars is quite a possibility and that if life got started on Mars it might still have found a way to survive, perhaps in little underground caverns where liquid water might exist if only temporarily. so that. It's really just a stepping stone, no pun intended, on the road to searching for life on other planets and throughout the universe. It's certainly enough to get NASA the money it needs to launch a new billion-dollar Mars program. 
Mars Global Surveyor takes off just four months after the meteorite press conference and begins sending back new, higher resolution images. Eight months later, on July 4, 1997, Mars Pathfinder is the first space probe to land on the red planet in more than two decades. Sojourner, a six-wheeled miniature rover, captivates a television audience larger than the one that watched the moon landing in 1969. That very successful, uh, just absolutely exciting experiment of landing and roving on the surface for the first time, that has led us to feel comfortable that we should plan for aggressive exploration where we return to the surface frequently with small landers. While NASA begins work on a new series of landers, Mars Global Surveyor is still clicking away. In 1998, Global Surveyor returns to Cydonia and re-photographs the face on Mars. When you look at the higher resolution photos, I think that no unbiased observer can see a face. Instead, you see that there are some interesting rock formations that from the right angle might suggest a face. But the new pictures don't change everyone's minds as NASA had hoped. Global Surveyor saw the face illuminated from below, kind of like holding a flashlight under your chin on Halloween, so the image was very distorted geometrically. It looked nothing like the Viking image. Ultimately, the face on Mars is in the eye and mind of the beholder. People are welcome to look them up on the internet and see what these new images look like, and they sure look like a coincidence. And it's kind of sad because, uh, you know, in both my scientific work and my fictional work, I love aliens. But you gotta have some skepticism, too. We've developed scientific analysis and reasoning to help us with those tricks that our mind is always happy to play on us. And in the case of the face on Mars, the evidence to me seems to be coming in continually. Yeah, it's still a piece of rock on the surface of Mars. A few months after the Cydonia pictures are released, a series of setbacks befalls the search for life on Mars. The first occurs in December 1998, when NASA launches Mars Climate Orbiter. But when we got there with Mars Climate Orbiter, we came too close to the planet, and the spacecraft burned up. Then, on December 3rd, 1999, the full steam ahead Mars program is dealt a crushing blow. Mars Polar Lander, the first lander set to explore the ice at Mars' south pole, doesn't make it. When the legs unfolded and the rocket lit to slow the spacecraft down to a gentle landing, the computer software in the lander got a signal that said that we had already reached the ground. Unfortunately, we were well over 100 feet from the surface. The the computer told the engines to shut off. We were on the surface, and it fell and crashed. Conspiracy theorists and mainstream scientists alike begin to talk about a kind of Martian-Bermuda Triangle. More than half the probes sent to Mars since 1960 have failed. Russia has lost 16 out of 19. The U.S., 4 out of 12, including the $1.4 billion Mars Observer in 1993. Japan is 0 for 1. Their first and only probe, Nozomi, is currently out of its planned orbit, slingshotting around the sun, and may return to Mars, if they're lucky, in 2001. People talk of the great Martian ghoul or the great galactic ghoul, and even scientists use this terminology, but they don't mean it literally. They're the real Bermuda Triangle and the great real ghoul is us. We make mistakes. But that's the business that we're in. When you try to send robots to some far off place, when we can't even design a robot that'll vacuum your rug, uh, we're a daring people. And as Henry the Navigator would have said in 1450s, he said, we're gonna take losses along the way. Fortunately, most of our losses are little robots. I think that life on Mars has begun to be uh, a place where we can place our fantasies, where we can project that mystery that we, we really need. After the devastating twin defeats of the $175 million Mars Climate Orbiter and the quarter billion dollar Mars Polar Lander, the timetable for future U.S. missions to Mars is in doubt. 
But on the cusp of the 21st century, plans for what we will do when we can get there are clear. Look for life. The extraordinary thing about Mars is the water that has flowed there. And that is the only way we really know how to look for life. Uh, we associate it with water, probably correctly so. In any place there's been water or is water is probably a good place to look. I think that if we can go to Mars and look in ancient stream beds with automated rovers and find likely looking rocks, bring some of them back to Earth, I think it's very likely we would find some signs of ancient life on Mars, similar to the oldest life on Earth. Some of the most recent images of Mars taken by Global Surveyor indicate that water flowed on the surface of the planet in modern geological time, which could mean anywhere from a few hundred to a few million years ago. At one time, Mars, I think, had a lot of water on the surface. Now, where did it go? Well, that's the problem, but if you go deep within the surface, then there, you would expect to find liquid water, and perhaps that's where uh, uh, life, uh, life survived. Life is incredibly adaptable, and, and surely if it started on Mars and conditions changed, it would go to those places where it could survive and adapt to the, the conditions. The most challenging question for Mars today is how do we find the water, which may very well be in liquid form deep below the surface? One possibility is to erect a well digging scheme which undoubtedly will best be done by humans. NASA believes it will soon be possible to bring humans to the surface of Mars. We've never been in better shape to launch a great age of exploration than we are now. If the next president in the spring of 2001 was to get up in front of the nation in the same way that John F. Kennedy did in the spring of 1961 and commit us towards this goal, we could have humans on Mars by 2008. The problem right now is largely economic, with most of the expense being generated by the need to launch astronauts in a single massive rocket equipped for a round-trip Mars mission. But according to former Lockheed Martin engineer Robert Zubrin, it can be accomplished with two smaller boosters like the ones used for the space shuttles. The first one shoots off to Mars, a Earth return vehicle with nobody in it. It lands on Mars and then run a pump and you suck in the Martian air, which is mostly carbon dioxide gas. And you react that with a little bit of hydrogen that you brought from Earth to produce a large supply of methane and oxygen rocket propellant. So now you got a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting on the surface of Mars. Once that's done, you use the other rocket to shoot the crew out to Mars. And because their return ride is waiting for them, they don't have to fly to Mars in some gigantic Death Star spaceship. They don't even have to fly to Mars in a comparatively modest Millennium Falcon. They can fly to Mars in a tuna can. But for long-term exploration, scientists must figure out how to keep the astronauts alive on the surface of Mars. A spacesuit just won't cut it in the hostile Martian environment. So current thinking is that instead of changing humans to suit Mars, we change Mars to suit humans. It's a concept called terraforming. Now the place is cold. We know how to warm places up. We're doing it right here on Earth right now. Greenhouse gases. And so now it starts getting warm enough that the, some of the frozen water in the soil start to melt out. You start getting more water vapor in the atmosphere. We start getting rain. You start getting conditions where plants can start spreading on the surface. Terraforming advocates believe that once a more conducive Martian atmosphere begins to form, the manufacture of oxygen can begin. But that will be a problem for another generation. You know, it's kind of like the way we look at Jules Verne, who, who knew we were going to go to the moon, but he did it with artillery. You know, a 19th century mind approaching a 20th century problem, okay? The fact that we who are alive today can discuss terraforming is proof that it's doable. But I think that the people that ultimately do it will do it in more sophisticated ways than we today can project. Zubrin sees human development of Mars as nothing less than our destiny. No sooner does any barren place appear on the surface of the Earth, you know, like Hawaii, a bare piece of basalt coming out of the Pacific Ocean, then birds fly over and drop seeds, and so plants grow and it becomes a living place, and then Polynesians show up and let loose pigs, and then Europeans show up and build hotels, you know. This, this is what we do. Uh, life makes places better for life. And although terraforming was born from the pages of science fiction, mainstream science acknowledges that they are working on it too. 
yes, such a thing might be possible. And many science fiction writers have written about how this might be, and there have been NASA studies to talk about it. But time is measured in hundreds of thousands of years, and the human kind thus far has been reluctant to take on projects of that length. For now, the priority is short-term, low-cost projects. But the bigger question is always there, waiting to be answered. Is life there at all? We don't know. There is, right now, no strong evidence, no smoking gun that says life was ever present on the planet. It's that question that we're after. I think we need to know a lot more about the cosmos that we inhabit. There are a lot of ways to do that, but Mars is actually within reach. Sometime in the year 2003, if all goes according to plan, a landing vehicle called Beagle 2 will parachute to the surface of Mars. The lander is being built at a cost of about $40 million, nearly half coming from corporate sponsors. Like an extraterrestrial race car, Beagle 2 may well include the logos of companies that are supporting the project. Commercials aside, the mission's goal is as old as humanity, to determine whether we may have company within our own solar system. To discover more about this and other topics, please visit our search engine at historychannel.com.